Hi everyone. Welcome to today's episode of OBG and Akets. An attempt to deliver maximum amount of information to you in a short span of time on conceptual OBG. So the topic for today that we have is something that is not really much understood by obstetric residents, obstetrics residents and uh, all the students who are learning obstetrics for the first time. They believe that it is often a part of the neonatologist or the pediatrician to understand the segment. But I would say it is a significant part of our learning that definitely merits our attention and understanding of the topic and the topic for that today is hydrops fetalis. So what is hydrops fetalis? It's a Greek word that uh, roughly means that edema. So hydrops fetalis means edema of the baby. So here, as you can see, there is a clinical picture that I have shown. And on that clinical picture, you can see that this was a five to six months. I think it was a six months uh, fetus that we had delivered. We had done a medical termination of pregnancy for uh, the baby had a cardiac anomaly and the baby on ultrasound has shown signs of hydropsy. Here you can see that the abdomen is quite distended. It looks that it uh, belly of that baby, of that fetus instead, has a lot of fluid that has accumulated in it. It does have ascites. So, what are the causes of hydrops fetalis that we know of? So, 10% of the causes are of immune origin. So, immune hydrops fetalis consists of lysis of the red blood cells, something that we have read since a long time in RH negative women who are isoimmunized. They have cells, the red blood cells in the fetus that are lysed by the antibodies that come from the mother. We also call it erythroblastosis fetalis and a lot other significant hematological wherein the RBCs of the fetus are lysed by maternal antibodies come under the heading of immune hydrops. But they just form 10% of the total number of cases of hydrops fetalis. So what are the other reasons and the more significant ones? It falls under non-immune hydrops which forms 90% of the cases. All these 90% of the cases are to do with individual systems. So it can either be a cardiac system. So in cardiac system, you can have structural abnormalities. You can have Epstein's anomaly. You can have cardiomyopathies. You can have tetralogy of palate. The other heading under which it comes is a significant one is chromosomal abnormalities. So in chromosomal abnormalities, you can have Turner syndrome. You can have Down syndrome in whom you would see these anomalies. In fact, the first sign in a chromosomal anomaly, an example that I'd like to give you is in trisomy 21. In Down syndrome, whenever you do the NTNB scan in that the nuchal translucency is often raised. It is an indicator that near the nuchal, nuchal is the neck, nuchal area is the neck region of the 11 to 14 weeks fetus, there is accumulation of fluid, which is why there is increase in the nuchal translucency. This can happen not just with any trisomy, but also if the fetus is going to have any cardiac anomaly or any other anomalies that I'm going to talk of subsequently. So the increase in nuchal translucency is an early indicator of impending hydrops, possibility of impending hydrops. The other ones include hematological manifestations, something like alpha thalassemia or something like uh, beta thalassemia major, other hemoglobinopathies, infections, a very important cause, torch infections, that is toxoplasma, rubella, uh, cytomegalovirus, congenital herpes, all these are significant causes of non-immune hydrops. The next one are placental causes. So placental tumors called as chorangiomas, they have a lot of vascularity. So the baby's heart has to supply the blood also to those tumors. Rather the circulation, the fetal circulation has a part of, has a part to play in supplying blood to the large vascular tumor that has developed on the placenta because of which these fetuses have heart failure. Thoracic, in thoracic we have pulmonary sequestration. We have a very significant diaphragmatic hernia that can cause this. Finally, in renal anomalies, we can have multiple things like barter syndrome. We can have absence, renal agenesis, a lot more things that can even occur with the renal system. But of all things, why should this even happen? I understand that the baby might have anomalies, but why should the anomalies lead to the formation of hydrops fetalis? So the pathophysiology behind that is, let us first assume that the baby or that the fetus had immune hydrops. So when the fetus had immune hydrops, it started having anemia. It started, the fetus started having anemia because there was lysis of its own 
red blood cells by the maternal antibodies the igg antibodies that were coming from the mother this led to the production this led to an increased production of rbcs by places other than the bone marrow and the other places were the liver and the spleen now the liver the liver which is anywhere tiny organ in that fetus now has to do the work of hematopoiesis and hence it doesn't or it is unable to do its own function and one of the functions is protein production alpha fetoprotein which is the equivalent of albumin inside a fetus is produced in lesser quantities now when this is produced in lesser quantities there is decrease in the oncotic pressure oncotic pressure is the amount of pressure that is there inside uh, the vessels so whenever the oncotic pressure decreases there is exudation there is transudation in fact of all the fluid into the interstitial interstitial space the interstitial space also includes a third space the third space loss that includes a peritoneum that includes the uh, pericardium it also includes the uh, pleural membranes so in the pleural cavity as well the fluid starts accumulating now in cases of any other anomalies it can be fetal malformations like any heart disease or something like diaphragmatic hernia or placental tumors what happens is whenever these fetuses have heart failure this heart failure first of all leads to left sided failure basically when the heart fails the left side of the heart that is the left ventricle stops supplying blood to the body this leads to tissue hypoxia tissue hypoxia leads to cell death and an increased capillary permeability now you have read in the chapter on inflammation that whenever there is hypoxia there is endothelial dysfunction and this leads to increase in the spaces between the endothelium and there is transudation of the fluid from the vessels outside also because the heart has failed there is also back pressure changes so there are changes which also occur in the failure of right ventricular failure and hence there is back pressure that increases completely now because of this back pressure there is increased hydrostatic pressure and this increased hydrostatic pressure also leads to accumulation of the fluid in the interstitial space and finally because of all these factor when there is increased amount of accumulation of fluid in this interstitial and third space there is causation of hydrops italis so this explains the pathophysiology behind immune as well as non immune hydrops and why does it lead to heart failure and eventual ascites and finally hydrops fetalis invariably hydrops fetalis because it's heart failure there is intrauterine fetal death and the outcomes are very very poor i hope you understood this lecture on hydrops fetalis it is a very important topic and we shouldn't think that it is something that the neonatologists should be doing it is something that us and not just fetal medicine people or neonatologists should be good at thank you